YouTube. Great, so it gives me great pleasure to welcome our guest speaker today, uh, Professor Sandra Diaz. And Sandra is a professor of ecology at Cordoba National University in Argentina and a senior member of the National Research Council of Argentina. She founded the Nucleo Diversus on diversity and sustainability. And internationally, she's co-chaired the Global Assessment of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPBES for short, and has spearheaded in particular this pluralistic conceptual framework uh, of nature in the IPBES Global Assessments, including this contribution, the, the notion of nature's contribution to people as a way of thinking about nature-human interactions. Uh, she's got a, a vast number of accolades, uh, including in 2019, she was elected as, the, as a foreign member of the Royal Society. Uh, and at that time, and I think still now, the only member from South America as a foreign member of the Royal Society. And also she's a member of the US Academy, National Academy of Sciences, along many, many other accolades. I've known Sandra for, for quite a few years now. She's a visiting professor at Oxford uh, here in our department. And uh, what, uh, what's always impressed me is that Sandra uh, publishes a whole range of fantastic ecological papers that synthesize across scales and look at fundamental ecological questions, but also she's deeply embedded in linking biodiversity science to policy and uh, as her work and with it, there's other things that show. And so this bridging this, this, this more pure dimensions of ecological science, so ask big questions, but also thinking about how this can be applied to the challenge of understanding and maintaining and restoring biodiversity on, on planet Earth. So it's great to have you here, Sandra, uh, and welcome. I don't know whether you want to say a few words of, of uh, hello first, and then we'll switch over to, to your recording. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the very generous presentation, Jadinder, and for the opportunity to, to give this talk today. I'm looking forward to, to share it with you and, and, and to answer the questions. Okay. Uh, welcome, Sandra. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to the pre-recorded presentation and play that now. Can everybody see that okay? Is that visible? Yep. Okay, so we'll switch over to this presentation. I think I can say with confidence that nearly all of you have heard or read recently that nature is in trouble. Because of that, I will not. Yeah, Devinder, I think if you unmute, we can uh, hear the audio coming from your computer. That nature is... There you go. That worked. Because of that, I will not spend much time on the issue. This is just a brief summary coming from the most recent and largest ever effort to summarize global trends. The vast majority of biodiversity indicators from genes to bios are declining globally. I could unpack this a bit and mention the large impacts on terrestrial and marine ecosystems, the fact that about 1 million of species are estimated to be threatened, the fact that today's extinction rates are higher than the average in the past 10 million years, and the fact less mentioned by the press that biocultural diversity, specifically the number of traditional varieties and breeds of domesticated plants and farm animals, is also decreasing sharply. Taking a more human perspective, most of nature's contributions to people, except food, fuel, and materials, are decreasing globally. 
and so far there's no satisfactory replacement for most of them. And a quick sampler of the press headlines at the time of release this, of this report shows a variety of possible interpretations or frame installation. But however you choose to frame it, the situation is quite bad. So the next obvious questions are why is nature in trouble and how to fix it? And in trying to answer this question, one realizes that nature is not only in trouble, but also nature is trouble, a lot of it. Nature is troublesome in more than one sense. And I learned this the hard way. Until about seven years ago, I was a blue sky plant ecologist. I was, and I still am, quite happy to be one. But at that time, I was offered a leading position in IBIS, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Some, some people call it the IPCC of biodiversity. And the task offered was to assess the state and trends of nature and its links with human beings at the global scale. I wouldn't say it looked easy, but at least it initially looked simple, manageable enough for a fully voluntary job to be done on the margins of my day job as a full-time researcher and professor. Of course, this first impression of simplicity ended up being quite wrong. This was the official mandate for the global assessment. As you can see, visibly ambitious, all about biodiversity, ecosystems, their benefits to people, and all these from the perspective not only of natural and social sciences, but also those of indigenous peoples and local communities. So, my first little task when I joined IBES was to lead the construction of the IBES own conceptual framework. Basically, an intellectual meeting space, a scaffolding for organizing ideas, information, and the work of very many different people in a relatively orderly and timely manner. The conceptual framework construction process started the way we all start the challenges. We try to apply the tools we already know and have worked well in the past. In this case, it started by trying to use the framework of previous global biodiversity efforts and also the framework of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment the closest antecedent in scope and intention. But very quickly, we realized that it was really not going to work this time. Spectacularly influential as the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment had been, its theory of change was far too simple, too rooted on narrow biology and classic economics. If we were to make a serious attempt to honor the new mandate and constellation stakeholders, we needed something else. I think the tension here can be summarized in the words of Georgina Mays in this brilliant article she wrote a few years ago, where she described the dominant paradigms for conservation, which I think can be applied more widely. Until recently, nature has been considered as something external to us and starkly separate from the human enterprise. And this applied no matter whether the focus was conservation of pristine nature because of extrinsic, intrinsic value, or like 
in the most classic version of the ecosystem service framework, nature as a stock of capital from which there are flows of goods and services to humanity. We needed to move beyond this towards this people and nature paradigm. So we created a new conceptual framework, not fully from scratch, of course. We carried out a lengthy, fairly participatory co-construction process over about three years with workshops and online consultations. An incredibly rich and fairly exhausting process. The first step was to agree on what is the minimum set of really important issues we wanted to talk about and how they fit together. Once we agreed on those, then we could disagree about what the priorities among the problems are and how to fix them. So the IDES conceptual framework has only a very small number of really synthetic concepts or elements, only six boxes and eight arrows. The names of the elements may strike you because of their simplicity. This is deliberate. It is because they were deliberately named in the plainest possible way. They needed to be meaningful and important to all stakeholders involved. But believe me, there was nothing simple in the process of choosing the names and building the definitions. This is the full official unpacked version of the conceptual framework. <clears throat> Each <clears throat> of these labels in, in black is an inclusive category. And one can approach them from very different perspectives. And back here in, um, in green and, and, and blue letters. For example, if we take nature, we all have mental images and feelings of what nature is, but this can be vastly different. As an ecologist, I can approach nature with categories such as biodiversity, the evolutionary process, biochemical cycles. But there are very many other ways to refer to nature. Even, even within mainstream science, the way a physicist, an economist, a sociologist, or an ecologist intellectually approach nature are quite different. For example, this is the way Alexander von Humboldt drew nature in the tropical Andes. Biochemists working today would probably see a bit more like this. And if you ask today's dwellers of the same vision, they draw this. Something that became obvious with the enrichment of our perspective is that although the classical categories of ecology and economy are obviously useful, they are not only epistemologically too narrow to represent many stakeholders and views, also from the purely mainstream ecology point of view, the evidence points to an inextricable intermoving, a constant exchange between people and the rest of the living, for better or worse, rather than a neat separation between them. So today, I prefer this definition. Living nature is the fabric of life, from genes to bio, woven, so to speak, by natural processes over millions of years and in conjunction with people for many thousands of years. So this fabric is being co-created deliberately or otherwise with humans interwoven with it. We are embedded in it. So it's not only about nutrients, water, energy, genes, 
it's also about institutions, livelihood, and stories. Is this just a metaphor? Certainly. But so are the other conceptualizations we have been using all the time to refer to our relationship with nature. We are just more used to it. And you may be wondering why, as this, at, at this urgent moment, with those, all these burning trends, should we dwell on metaphors? Well, precisely because action is urgent. Metaphors are not just labels. Metaphors help us make sense of the world. And by shedding light on some aspects of reality and obscuring others, metaphors provide a scaffolding for thinking, which in turn frames action. Why? That, that's why it's important to talk about that. Now, if you adopt this metaphor, then you start seeing all the other elements within this conceptual framework rather differently than before. For example, the ecosystem services for natural resources. According to the most classic version of ecosystem services, nature is the stock of natural capital from which there are flows or ecosystem services according to external demands, which are human needs and preferences. This works very well for some purposes, some stakeholders and some paradigms, but falls way short of capturing the whole of what we get from and with nature. So we prefer to talk about nature's contributions to people or NCT. Nature's contributions to people are all the good and bad things nature does for you as individual or member of societies. If possible, we call these contributions benefits. If they are negative, we call them benefits. And I could devote a whole seminar to the process of finding the right name. So nature's contributions to people or NCP for short is not perfect and it's a bit long, but it was the best that emerged from months of discussion involving physicists, ecologists, anthropologists, poets, and other various actors. And most people, when they hear or see this name, immediately form a mental picture of what we are talking about. And nature's contributions to people can be approached from very different perspectives as natural ecosystems, or, sorry, as natural resources, as ecosystem services, but also as nature's gifts and retaliations, etc. The concept, therefore, fully embraces ecosystem services and natural resources, but is epistemologically and methodologically more inclusive. And the entity from which the contribution emanates doesn't need to be at the ecosystem level. It can be at any level of the living world. It can be ecosystems, but also can be emanating from species, genes, deals, or even particular individuals. And the same entity of nature can be perceived as negative by some actors and positive by some others, and can be perceived differently at different times by the same actor. In the nature's contributions to people framework, these changes from positive to negative are not exceptions. They are systemic to the approach. And not only uh, the boxes allow multiple cultural approaches, the arrows too 
from the perspective of quantitative ecology and economics, these arrows here, four, seven, and six, uh, can, um, can be safely treated as unidirectional. But from the perspective of other disciplines and knowledge systems, these arrows are multiple reciprocal multidirectional flow with multiple care and responsibility, and in some cases, agency on more than one side. And the conceptual framework also recognizes that once generated, the contributions to people do not necessarily automatically transform themselves into well being for an unqualified humankind. Rather, uh, there are a number of socially determined access and distribution issues. Therefore, many of the problems we see today are more related with RO8 than with RO4. Another way in which this pluralism is operationalized is in the fact that there is not a single system, a unique classification written in stone to report nature's contributions to people. We use this one in the global assessment because it was a coordinated global large scale broad brush effort. But depending on the objective and the context, the actors can choose their own system to describe and assess the relevant nature's contributions to people. This framework, built on the basis of nature as the fabric of life and its contributions being multidimensional and having multiple differential values to people is not intended to be a comprehensive, fully self-consistent body of knowledge. Rather, it's an intellectual meeting space, a table for different knowledge practices to sit around and talk to each other. A tool not to forget to ask all the important questions as one stakeholder described. And although this framework is relatively recent, one can already see it being useful and fruitful. There is very interesting work cropping up in various places and institutions in the world describing links between nature and people that until recently were largely invisible in the mainstream literature. Here are some nice examples. Uh, like this one with wild megafauna species. There are examples with local seagrass ecosystems, local agroecosystems, ecosystems in general at the global scale, applications at the level of intraspecific diversity, the soil compartment. I honestly had never thought about the soil in this way before. And this one, one of my favorites with a fascinating narrative on how wild and domesticated camelids are kept and how they fit in the narratives and social history of the peoples of the High Andes, and how this mediates the links with national states and remote consumers. And there are many more. They provide perhaps a messier, but at the same time, richer, fuller picture of these interactions between various peoples and different facets of life on Earth. 
Now, even if you buy into this idea of interweaving and multiple values and perspectives, there are other ways in which the paradigm of stark separation between people and nature persists. It persists in seen nature, perhaps not as capital, but as an unpolluted, primeval, people-free Eden. An Eden from which we have been kicked out fairly recently, and therefore we can still go back. And looking at the main direct causes of nature's decline over the past 50 years, one would perhaps be justified to think that way. But it doesn't mean our impact on the rest of the fabric of life is recent. Indeed, the evidence points exactly to the contrary. Human reconfiguration of the fabric of life is pervasive and ancient. And our stamp is detectable on the vast majority of the ecosystems we now describe as natural, wild, or intact. The current biodiversity crisis is mostly the result of the appropriation, colonization, and intensification of use in lands inhabited for a long time by prior societies, rather than being the result of the recent loss of uninhabited wilds. So nature on Earth is human nature, and it has been so for a very long time, although there are very different styles of humanizing it. The accelerating trends of the past 50 years are just us getting particularly good at one particular style of dealing with nature. In view of this, putting most of the effort on the tiny pieces that do not hear our stamp is fairly impractical. We can find perhaps some bits of intact wilderness and protect and cherish them, but they are the exceptions, not the rule. They are not representative of the whole of life on Earth. This is why I think the recent emphasis on so-called shared landscapes and seascapes approaches make a lot of sense. They make a lot of sense to me because they contribute to focus on nature everywhere you can find it. And also, they take into account that many of nature's contributions to people are delivered at the local to micro regional scales. They require a certain proximity to be delivered. Therefore, the bits of nature that are close to people may not be as impressive as the last ultimate wilderness, but they are extremely important. So, in opposition to the isolation paradigm, the evidence strongly points to nature as intergoven deeply with people in different ways and to a highly humanized biosphere. But in addition to this, there is a third problem with looking at nature from the isolation paradigm point of view. If one examines why nature is in problem, and what is behind those direct physical impacts, there are a number of diffuse, global, indirect, socioeconomic drivers and some of them are originated locally, but the majority are not. With a rise in global trade of about 900% and a rise in global per capita spending of about 
50% over the past 50 years, there has been a massive increase in the connections between distant places on Earth, which we call telecouplings. These telecouplings are embodied in information, goods, financial resources, people, and all sorts of other organisms. Today, more than never before, choices in one place affect remote places. What is often not emphasized is the fact that a substantial portion of these telecouplings can only take place through the bodies of organisms. What hasn't been emphasized enough is that the threads of the fabric of life are all over the supply and production chains. There are many examples of that. Some of my favorite are this one, showing that about one third of the threads of animals worldwide are linked to international trade. Or this one showing the vast scale of exports of embedded pollination. Or this one showing the role of foreign investment and tax havens associated to nature degradation, in particular in fishing and in beef and soybean production in the Amazon. This is, by the way, three Pandora papers. So not only are we inextricably intermoving with the rest of the living, not only the biosphere has been reconfigured by us to a large degree, also this reconfiguration is increasingly triggered by distant processes and decisions. Because of all this global pervasive systemic diffuse socioeconomic drivers, we and virtually all other large scale reports have called for a change in the way we do things. A change that is transformative and systemic rather than only incremental and at the level of immediate symptoms. Now, you probably know that the 15 United Nations Biodiversity Conference is taking place as we speak. Postponed three times because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is, by the way, the mother of all examples of telecoupling mediated by the fabric of life. I'm not sure how closely you have been following the proposals and negotiations, but a lot of the conversation is dominated by issues like this one. It doesn't take much effort to realize that no matter how much we have advanced conceptually in the past few years, the most popular targets and places being proposed by various parties and lobbies seem to be pretty much still within the isolation parallel. Not that there is anything wrong with these proposals per se, they, they are necessary, they are good. But I fear that if all the attention and effort are consumed on them, they could distract from tackling the root causes of the crisis. I would feel much more reassured if the pledges included, for example, some significant reductions in the subsidies to some aspects in the energy sector, the agriculture, the international trade sectors that are clearly harmful to nature. And those resources would be redeployed to activities that enhance nature. I would very much like to see pledges, including setting prices that reflect the true environmental and social costs of food and services. I would like to see more emphasis on consumer responsibility in the monitoring and accounting of countries' biodiversity footprints, so that a country's footprints include the domestic one, 
but also the whole of the global footprint originated by this country's demands and business operations. And I would really like to see in the pledges bold incentives for keeping some proportion of wild native habitat within the landscapes where people work and live. This is just to name some examples. During the question time, we can discuss the reason why we are not seeing more of these issues featuring prominently in the pledges. So, right now, the only optimistic and realistic thing to do in the face of these massive challenges is to try to do the best we can while we can. This might end up not being enough, but is much better than doing nothing. And in this, um, wrapping up, I would argue that perhaps a fabric of life framework would be more conducive to transformative change than the dominant isolation framework to biodiversity. What would it mean to embody such approach in practice? Here are some thoughts. First, relates in relation to travel one, the nature of nature, concrete action needs to be anchored on the fact that human entangled with non-human nature is ancient, deep, and inextricable. It needs to embrace multiple modes of connection and multiple values of nature. Stock and flow models and the consideration of purely instrumental values only are useful, but used as the only or the highly predominant approach falls way short. Regarding humanized nature, trying to protect nature by separation from us is useful in some cases, but again, we need much more than this. And doing strict protection at a massive scale is bound to produce many undesirable consequences. We also need much more attention to the fabric of life in working and shared landscapes and seascapes. And regarding travel three, our human nature and the nature we want, no matter how inventive our new green technologies are, how creative our nature-based solutions are, how massive our tree planting initiatives, how many iconic species we manage to move from critically endangered to just endangered, nature will not show the degree of recovery needed according to the models if the systemic causes of its decline are not tackled. They are, I realize, quite difficult to tackle. But the important thing to bear in mind is that the predominant model of appropriation is not necessarily the only one. It's not human nature. It's only one possible model. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much, uh, Sandra. Uh, uh, very clear and absolutely fascinating. And I'm glad the after the initial hiccup on the technology was was, was smooth. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, we can open up to questions from the, uh, the audience. And uh, what I su suggest is generally I'll invite you to directly ask your question to Sandra. That it will have more of a live interaction by switching on your video and microphone and asking the question. If for any reason you can't do that, uh, just to either pop the question in the chat or just uh, 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 and I, I can read out the question and uh, we'll, do, we'll do it that way. Uh, just to kick things off while people are thinking off their, their questions, uh, I, I'll just start uh, and uh, ask about this, this fabric of life approach that, that it better has promoted. How have you found 
how much traction that's got since the assessment. Have you found certainly you know, within the your community people are talking about it? Have you found it's got traction in the wider policy arena the, or, the, or the, the business, you know, the, the natural capital discussions at all? Or are you still finding it's a relatively minority perspective? Uh, we found a lot of traction in the general public. When you talk to the general public, people love looking at the fabric of life rather than biodiversity. When you now it's not so bad, but in the very beginning you talked about biodiversity and people stare blankly. When you talk about the fabric of life, most of the public uh, feels really they feel what you mean and they feel engaged much more. A lot of the journalists love the metaphor. A lot of research groups um, love it. Uh, a lot of, uh, of the civil society are adopting it and they find it very natural and love it. Um, the policy arena, as I tried to convey in my talk, um, they, they applaud it, they, they use it in their speech, but then when they propose pledges, they completely ignore it. Um, yeah, okay. but Thanks. it's new. I mean, not the concept, but they, they're trying to, to use it in a more, in the broader sense, I think is quite new, new. So maybe just a question of, 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 of time, I don't know. Great, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll open up to questions. There's, there's a, a, a one in the chat, and also raise your hands if you don't want to type out your question, feel free to just raise your hand on Zoom and uh, uh, we can uh, follow through there. Uh, Tom, you had a, a question. Do you want to directly ask your question? Tom, sure, yeah. Uh, well, just to say thanks to Sandra for presenting this. I think it's really fascinating to hear about the, the IP Best journey and, you know, uh, linking the social sciences with the ecology and, and um, it's so essential. My question there is in the chat um, and, and I guess it's, um, it's about this language that we use and whether the transactional language around ecosystem services has become so dominant as a sort of paradigm now, whether we actually um, need to think about using other language when we engage people, because that, you know, there's dangers of crowding out of social norms um, and just replacing those norms with economic incentives. So I'm just wondering what um, Sandra's thoughts were on, on how we should engage and whether the, the level of language is okay at the moment or we should be changing. Thanks. Well, uh, in Ibis, we, I, you probably noticed, we use nature's contributions to people for a reason. Uh, one of the major obstacles for Ibis, uh, not, I mean, Ibis took ages to, to be officially formed mm -hmm. as an international assessment and body. And one of the reasons was because a number of parties just rejected the whole idea of ecosystem services, just rejected straight away. And I, I, I didn't realize, because I am a plant biologist, a plant ecologist, so I didn't realize it was the case until I sat at the table and we tried to put together a, a, a pluralistic conceptual framework. And then I discovered that uh, social scientists, sciences, not economics, uh, but other social sciences and humanities felt alienated for many years because the paradigms, as you said, were too transactional, too based on classic economics, and also too based in blue sky ecology, right? So we were, we were having the, the best of intentions in the world for many, many years in just inviting everyone at the table but people didn't find invited. The, 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 the problems, the language, the categories didn't speak to them. Uh, either they didn't relate to them or they just rejected it. So uh, that was the major journey of Ibis, really, trying to find that, uh, that conceptual framework that seems so elementary, but has a lot, a lot of sweat in it. And um, so I couldn't agree more strongly with you. That's why we use this language. And when we use 
this is not only the language, it's not just the politically correct way of calling things. You know, some people who say, oh, well, we just have to stick a politically correct label on things and that's okay. No, the concept is different. And the idea is that nature's contributions to people would include, of course, it doesn't reject ecosystem services, it includes them, it embraces them, but also embraces other ways of calling it. So we are not asking anyone to abandon their categories if they feel they're right for them. But when we all sit at the table, we invite people to use categories which are more plural. And we use in all our communication, I personally, I, I, I have many papers signed by me with the, the word ecosystem services, of course, in the past. But now I try to use the uh, uh, yeah, wider categories because I learned a lot of things I didn't know were there. And when I see all the wealth of knowledge that gets to the surface of the peer reviewed journals when you offer them a more inclusive framework, I, I just feel we did the right thing. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, Natalia? Are you there, Natalia? Can you tell us? Yes. Sorry, I was unmuting myself. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Diaz, thank you very much for your talk. Um, it was great to see a little bit of your trajectory from like functional ecologist all the way to like working in this um, biodiversity world. And so I have I have two questions. So one is that um, so it was very interesting when you when you talk about. Um, like the how how people uh, perceive uh, certain things that humans do to nature, both in a positive and in a negative way, right? For instance, like uh, like fires in the in the in the um, in the Andes, right? So it's being like a like a natural process uh, for like since you know humans have been habitated. Uh, the Andes, but now because of uh, climate change, you know, these practices are being uh, almost, um, are seen very badly, right, for the general public. So I was wondering, you know, if you have seen um, instances in which, you know, these um, to communities, right? The people who rely in these like changing of the environment and uh, these other people have come to uh, have been able to reach kind of like a middle term into, I don't know, kind of accepting that, you know, like in certain areas, people have been, you know, this being a, a, a practice that has been going on forever and that's how they, you know, like the native people from an area have been managing the resources. And my second question is related. You, you said something about like, um, like benefits um, of nature to people and that we should go beyond the, the, the stocks and all these other things that you did. So you mentioned this, but you, you didn't say like, what would be these other, uh, these benefits that we should promote, right? So I was wondering if you have a, uh, a comment, if you can extend on that, on that point as well. Uh, thank you. I can ask you, I can answer the first part. And then I, I, I wasn't completely sure of, you want an example of what exactly? Well, in, in one of your last slides, um, so I, it, it was a little fast, so I, I didn't have time to, uh, to write it down. But I remember you saying something that we should move beyond like the carbon stocks and all these other things that oh, yeah. um, so we, we usually see as uh, so how we can give back to nature, right? So I was wondering if you have more examples about it. Okay, yeah, I'll try. So um, the whole idea of nature's contributions to people is that within the general framework in which, of course, what we get from nature uh, in terms of the benefits we get from nature as, as a species are much, much bigger than the 
the problems and, and detriments and nuisances we have from nature, right? That, that's the, the framework, but within that framework, of course, not everything, everybody at any time gets from nature is positive, you know? If you go to the tropics and get full of leeches, you won't think they are, you know, benefits from nature to you. So um, in previous frameworks, the negative uh, contributions from nature to people were treated as exceptions because you assume that uh, they were mostly services and there was a universal way of, you know, them being positive and positive to everyone. The enrichment by the social scientists to the inverse conceptual framework meant that whether an entity of nature is positive or negative depends on a lot of things and it depends on what kind of social art actor you are. So whether, I don't know, a tiger or, or a tree or a bunch of grass is uh, wonderful or terrible to you, there's not a general value for the whole of humanity, it depends pretty much on what social actor you are. And it also changes with you, me, for the same person. For example, it's a great paper um, that looks at the value for farmers of scavengers and, and predators, you know, wolves and foxes and vultures and all these kind of um, animals. And they show how, uh, for the same farmer, depending on the time of the year, they're positive or negative. And so whether you consider the benefit or the detriment is something subject to social negotiation. There's no one single universal answer that should trump everyone else. Um, to me, that uh, makes things much more difficult than before, but to me it's an advancement in trying to make visible all the, the social actors involved in, in managing nature. Um, yeah, I, I probably answered both of your questions there, but if I didn't, just let, let me know. Thank you. Okay, we've got quite a lot of few questions lining up now. So, uh, Alison, next. Hi, yeah, sorry, can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Great. Um, <clears throat> actually, it's kind of a bit of a follow on from um, Yavinda's yeah, first question to you in a way. Um, uh, and you, you, you noted that um, policymakers, whilst they use it in their rhetoric, don't actually seem to be, um, you know, they kind of ignore it in actual policy regulatory work. Um, and you mentioned that time, this is new. But aside from time um, and the percolation of these new, this new way of thinking, do you have any other thoughts about what it might take? Sorry, what do you might take what? I, oh, um, I, I miss okay. it. Okay, um, I was just following on from Ravinda's question um, about, uh, you had said that policy, the policy makers were using it in their rhetoric, but not yeah, yeah. actually when it came to policy. You mentioned yeah. that time is obviously an issue. This is new thinking. Um, but I wondered if you had any other thoughts on what might be required aside from time to get this into policy making? Uh, yes. Uh, in, in, a, in, a in a single and simplistic word, pressure. That's the only thing. I mean, I have this um, great old South African colleague that says that uh, policy makers make changes for two, reasons. One is because they see the light, but the main reason is because they feel the heat. And I think that it's a combination of light and heat that is going to make the changes. Um, they, they use the rhetorics of the fabric of life, but then do nothing. And to be perfectly honest, they use the numbers of the economic assessments of biodiversity. They use them too in their rhetorics and they do nothing as well. <laughs> I mean, all the, 
the, the, the latest econo and economic valuations of nature are probably, by no, no doubt they are the best and the latest, but there have been economic valuations of nature for, I don't know, 25 years now, and they are ignored completely. Because economic value only, only makes sense if somebody is, is prepared to pay. Otherwise, it's just a number. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, Maria? Uh, hi, yes, hello. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra. That was like someone already said, it was quite fascinating. I'm just wondering, could you please elaborate um, on the new um, type of pledges? It would be useful for us to, to create and also comment on existing initiatives we have, such as fair trade, for instance. Yeah, um, hmm. there are so many initiatives. Uh, I, I just feel very reluctant to, to mention any, but um, basically I think the important thing is doing anything that you think that at the same time as dealing with the Simpsons, say, you know, organize a neighborhood, plastic, recycling initiative or, you know, plant a bunch of, a bunch of trees in your park or whatever, uh, or, you know, make a pot of money to buy some bit of protected area, whatever, uh, people start thinking and working towards a, a real change on the, um, on what we, uh, perceive as we need uh, for, for success as, as individuals and as societies. I feel that as, as long as the demands for a number of things, the demands for low prices and the demands of, for, for certain things, and, and as, soon as, as, as long as, as the uh, international prices and regulations for for everything we do and eat and consume don't change. Uh, we are just going to be applying painkillers and antibiotics. So the analogy I, I use sometimes is that uh, if you have somebody who is constantly jumping from the roof of a very tall building uh, and you are trying to assist this person, of course you, you want to give this person uh, I don't know what happened with my, I don't know what happened with my, uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, uh, something happened with my, with my um, uh, camera. Um, one second. We, we can still see you fine, Sandra, and hear you. Okay, uh, okay. Let me, let me try something else uh, now. Yeah, we can still see you. We, we, okay. we didn't lose you. Okay, well, um, so uh, looking at the analogy, uh, if somebody jumps from the roof, um, oh, hold on, I, I think it's, it's less destructive this way. Um, you, uh, of course, want to give this person painkillers and antibiotics so they don't die instantly. Uh, but if you don't fix the bones, and if you don't stop the person from jumping from the roof again and again, then in, in the long term, you will achieve nothing. So I do feel that many of the initi initiatives that everyone of us are involved are pretty much in, at the level of the painkillers and the um, antibiotics are not enough on the other things simply because they are so hard to do. Uh, but we have to go there uh, because otherwise there will be no recovery. There will be just little bits of recovery that the recovery we saw during the pandemics, uh, but no real long-term recovery. 
and while I, I hear, um, let me let me try one thing. I I don't like not seeing you. Okay. And now. Can you see me now? Yeah. No. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, that's right. We can see you, you can now. see part of me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. And now? That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Okay. Over to Yannick. Question. Uh, thank you, Mike. My question is uh, really about what uh, the presentation we just received. Can you speak uh, up? Yes, um, I'm trying. My question is, or rather a comment, is whether there is a really connection between research and academics uh, and the people really who pass decisions or make decisions. Uh, that could result into action to preserving biodiversity and nature. Because I feel that uh, the researchers and the academics in a large part have done their role, but uh, we don't see any connection between themselves and the people who make the decisions uh, based on the, on, on the research. And it is people like in the NGO sector, for example, uh, take the results of research to make action. For example, uh, the idea of preserving the world, 30% uh, of the world by 2030, which is kind of a uh, hurriedly um, uh, idea because it is so ambitious uh, to preserve the world, 30% of the world by 2030, uh, while probably it is just one percent of the people know why or how, so is there really a connection between these researchers and the people who make decisions? Sorry, the connection between the people who make the decisions and who? And researchers, academics, or research, oh, academic oh, yeah, research. okay, um, not enough, not enough. Um, I would say uh, that uh, probably the process of, of designing the new global biodiversity framework, the one who is, which is being discussed by the CBDCs uh, week, has been the best ever collaboration between researchers and policymakers. Because the amount of science that got into the global biodiversity framework, not the pledges, the framework, now, the, the big document, which is still under negotiation, is unprecedented. Having said that, that <clears throat> unprecedented level of collaboration is far from enough. We need a lot more. And um, what we are not getting enough is um, also not enough involvement between the, the big policy making and the researchers and the local people working on the ground. Uh, I've seen, for example, um, a number of uh, global government initiatives with the best intentions in the world, with all the support from the researchers. And when you see them working in practice, they end up uh, with completely the wrong outcome for biodiversity. And they end up, mm, uh, they were meant to penalize more uh, the most powerful actors and be more gentle to the less powerful actors. But in practice, because of lack of a connection and dialogue in the, in the ground with the people, you end up having exactly the, the opposite uh, effect. We have some concrete examples in my area of the world, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 Adriana? Yes, thank you, Sandra, for your contributions. 
My question is more about how you and the IPVS ES, um, with their framework define nature, about the, na the definition of nature. Because in some cases, scientists or philosophers consider humans, consider that humans are part of nature. Uh, and really, there's no consensus in the definition of nature. So uh, my question is why IPBES decided to define nature as the relation between nature and human societies, uh, how these institutions and government systems interact with uh, or have an impact in nature. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Why is this interaction between the natural world and human societies uh, is defined um, by the organization as nature? Okay, um, I'm going to get into little gritty definitional issues here. In the framework, in order to make the, the work reasonably understandable. If you look at the, at, the, at the diagram of the framework, people and the non-human nature are all over the boxes, right? But the box called nature <clears throat> is the box where we put all the, the evidence, the information, the ideas that concern all those things that are living and are mostly not us, which doesn't mean they are not model configured, sculpted by us, right? Um, so in the in the in the the box nature, we don't talk about you know uh, I don't know um, things like traditional health or, or, you know, demographics or uh, purely social issues, right? That was a way to organize the, 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 the boxes. Now, why I use the word fabric of life? Precisely because the way the fabric of life erases a bit the, the sharp distinction between people and nature. Uh, conceives people and nature as, as, as a fabric, as an intricate web. So all the natural, all the world out there is uh, strongly reconfigured by us. And there's nothing we, we can do about it and nothing we should do in the sense that it's part of us. You know, some people who say that nature out there is our extended phenotype today <laughs> because our influence is not just killing it, our influence is much more subtle. It's just gardening it and, 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 and reconfiguring it in, in so many ways. And on the other hand, we are not fully human if, if we are separate from nature. I mean, it's, it's obvious, I'm not going to argue, uh, to, to argue with you why so. So by talking about the fabric of life, it allows you to talk about the continuum between people and what's outside us, but is living and our institutions together with the loss of nature, if you want, right? That's why uh, I, use, I use, I mean, and not the whole Ibis uh, uses uh, the fabric of life so comfortable. I, I, I think it's really, really useful. And as an ecologist, I, I think there's a lot of evidence for it. Uh, I also use nature and people because it's in, in common language is something we use so much and is so useful, provided you, you make clear that it's not that you see nature and people as completely separate worlds, but it, it's, a, it's a duality, if you want to, to say it that way. Great. I'll just interject and throw in another question. You say that very much that there's a multiple different ways of looking at human nature relationships to ban different users use different ones and there's polarity are there some usages that you think are positively dangerous or detrimental and I, just as an example i find that from my own personal bias when i see scientific papers talking about natural capital i actually have quite a negative reaction to that i think this is a certain framing that's actually quite destructive being applied to uh, to, to a rich, diverse natural world, and, and so, so my own personal bias, but I, but are 
things like a market-based framing of nature uh, actively harmful rather than just another useful framework that could be useful in certain times. Just like interesting to get your thought on that. Right. I think what is really not useful, what is really harmful, is the present model of appropriation of nature. You know, that model that you can call it many names, but is basically taking as much as possible profit from everything you can get your hands on nature people everything together you know <laughs> they know you this model to extract maximum uh, profit with maximum efficiency in a minimum time and then move on now maximum profit maximum obsolescence no consideration of anything else that's the the that's the model of appropriation of nature which i think is so bad and is unfortunately sold everywhere as human nature, right? As it was, uh, you know, the only possible way humans have to interact with nature, which I don't think so, you know, it's just very, very powerful. So um, that's what I feel. About natural capital, I, I, I don't particularly like it or use it either, but I have to say that there's a lot of brilliant work which I think it does a lot of good to nature or people that is framed within the natural capital name, right? So I don't want to be, um, uh, how you call it? I, I think I, we need to be pluralistic. It doesn't really matter how, on the other, on the one hand, it does matter how people frame and name things because that's the way you frame it. And when you frame things, you obscure some things and you put the light on it. So I, I do care about names, but I wouldn't uh, discriminate or I wouldn't uh, exclude. I wouldn't put a, a, a minus sign in necessarily in all the work that uses economic uh, language. Uh, because some of it is pretty good there. Just well, I mean, a lot of people for a long time were basically trying to shoehorn what they wanted to say and do within established language was pretty much economic. And the intention wasn't really a commodification or anything. So I try to, I think we need to be really open minded in, in, that, in that sense. Thank you. I personally it's, prefer not to use it, but I, I wouldn't criticize people for using it if they find it useful. Great, thank you. I'll just take one from the chat before moving on, on to the effect. Uh, so Katie can't uh, unmute her microphone. Uh, uh, she was wondering if there's any progress in making nature's contributions to people more useful in quantitative research or applied conservation. She was reading uh, when I'm trying to use it in a dissertation work, it was difficult to find data or information for the more subjective categories, e.g. Oh. the landmark maps that show information held by indigenous peoples and, and local communities. Great. Uh, when, when did you do your, your re uh, literal review? I don't know whether Katie can answer in the chat. <laughs> right, okay. Okay, well, I, I, I'll, I'll answer. Last year, so. last year. Okay, well, the thing is, um, the detailed research is only now coming up. Uh, I don't know whether you noticed, but most of the uh, examples I use in my talk of what I thought it was a fruitful application of NCP is 2020, 21, and and some of them are in the making, and I know I know they coming because I get to review them in some cases. So it's an emerging area. Um, not, all, not all of this is quantitative for all the, the obvious reasons. I mean, when you talk about the, the identity value of something is not always useful uh, or easy to put it a quantitative units to it. But it's coming. There's a lot of empirical evidence coming up uh, every every day in the literature. So you just have to wait uh, one or two years if, if you can if you can manage that. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, Vivek, would you like to ask a question? 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Edwinder. Um, um, my, uh, I'm researcher, uh, research fellow from uh, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation in, in India. I, I work among uh, uh, First Nations of India, uh, the community is who are uh, uh, located in remote parts of India. Uh, so my question here is, uh, um, I love this uh, uh, NCP uh, metaphor, uh, nature's contribution to people. Um, but similarly, uh, 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 how could we formalize the reciprocal metaphor, like uh, uh, people's contribution to nature? So there are uh, human services to nature, uh, care and stewardship services. How could we bring in as a, uh, a primary component of the NCP framework? Uh, the people's contribution to nature. So formalizing it will, uh, when we formalize people's contribution to nature as an important component, uh, equal to the nature's contribution, contribution to people, that will have huge potential to build the uh, care economy, stewardship economy. So once we build the care economy and stewardship economy, it will bring huge uh, political pressure on because care economy uh, will be intrinsically livelihood based livelihood that is dependent on caring for nature and stewardshiping for nature uh, may it be in the forest uh, uh, regions or agricultural regions so this stewardship act activities will become livelihood by themselves with knowledge intensive uh, measures so uh, what do you think on how it best could formalize uh, this uh, people's contribution to nature? Thank you very much. Well, first, I couldn't agree more strongly with you. Actually, um, uh, these, are, these sets of arrows uh, linking nature with NCPs, with humans, wells being, are all mutual arrows. They were there put us as one directional, as, as a practical thing in the very beginning. But we, as learning within the process, we realized they were all mutual. And in these, these days, we um, fully, fully incorporate nature, people's contributions to nature, just inverting the arrow that connects, arrow four in the, in the framework, so connecting the NCPs with nature is extremely important in many, many cultures of the world that's embedded in the, in the, in the, in the culture. You know, if you want to do, for example, in my area of the world, I'm sure in India there are many as well. In all the Andean world, there's uh, a lot of uh, things. There's a lot of obligations and the work, the, the word is literally obligations that you have to provide to the land, to mother nature, if you want in order to get what she wants or maybe she doesn't want to give you, right? So it's not a stock and flow. It's nature is not the, the pot where you just take until it's empty. There's a, a negotiation for which um, you, nature gives gifts and in order to keep having those gifts, you have to comply with your obligations, right? Uh, that's one way of saying it. So I think that is embedded in the in the managed practices in the sorry in the management practice of many many traditions in the world. They just have been invisible. And what we've been trying to do, and I hope we we succeed, is in helping them make visible. And as you say, when you realize there's a lot to be looked after in nature, then all these jobs that people feel will be lost <laughs> suddenly yeah. come to the front. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Hey, Sue. Thank you. Um, just wanted to think about baselines for a minute. We older people um, are aware of, not many of you here, um, are, are aware of what nature used to look like when we were young and, and the, the, the bioabundance that we had in those days. Yeah. Um, and as time goes on, that baseline has shifted. And, to, and I wonder to what extent that has actually spoiled people's relationship with nature if it's not so visible for them in the first place. 
obviously urbanization has caused that in any case, but I presume we have a, a reduced relationship with nature because it's just not fair anymore. And also as the, as the baseline shifts and becomes the new normal, when people talk about how to improve nature and, and the planners and developers are all about net gain from the, the current pathetic baseline, should we be thinking about an absolute level of recovery? And the suggestion that, that my group are coming up with is that we attempt to get nature to the state that it was at a specific moment in time, like 1970 or, or 1950, whenever it, it, it was best that we knew that that, that particular ecosystem or that particular habitat which is, was at its most rich, rather than using the current baselines that we have at the moment. Uh, yeah, well, I, I agree that uh, you get used to bad things little by little, and then you realize you just get used to the bad things. So you you don't you don't miss uh, the good things anymore because you you forgot they what they were. So I agree with that. And the baseline is a big problem in ecology. My understanding is that there's a lot of discussion in the global biodiversity framework about precisely baselines whether the baselines should be 2010, 2020, the 90s, the 70s. And each baseline you take has a huge political uh, connotations because of course, um, governments want to, to get the most, uh, as much as they can in terms of looking good, in terms of commitments, with as little sacrifice as they can possibly get away with. So there's a lot of political tension on, on those uh, baselines. Now, in terms of restoring diversity to what baselines, I guess any realistic baseline we can think of today will be, as you described, a pathetic state with relation to previous states. And I, wasn't I, I wouldn't be sure what would be the, you know, the initial the zero state as as, as this paper I, I showed in the, in the talk uh, shows, uh, there's basically no, no non-human state of nature in, on earth right now, except on extremely few places. Mm. So I guess we need to agree on a reasonable baseline, which is not so pathetic and, and work with that. Yes, thank you. If I, if I could just pitch in a slightly different take on that as well. Uh, that much of classical con uh, conservation, particularly in the after 70s and 80s, was focused on species composition and getting species back to a certain baseline, whichever baseline you picked. And even the UK in the 1950s is severely depleted to the UK of say, the 1500 or 1000 years ago or whatever, or the Pleistocene uh, megafaunal extinctions and beyond there. Uh, and, uh, an argument that's often made in the rewilding literature, and I think it's actually quite a powerful one, is to focus more on function rather than composition. Uh, and because climate change, species invasions, all the things that are of the Anthropocene have meant that it's very hard to go back in composition to the past. We, we have to think of the composition of the future, and maybe our aim should be a certain level of functionality and self-will in nature. Uh, uh, often the, the rewilding sort of bringing self-will and agency back into nature rather than focusing on particular composition of nature and maybe that's another way of thinking of where we're trying to head rather than trying to go back to the past we're heading into a very different future but, and trying to have nature as vibrant and pos as possible in that future yeah, yeah, that's a certain, certain take on that okay uh but maybe on to to andre Thanks, Edifinda, and thanks, Sandra, for the presentation. Really, really great to see. I wanted to touch base on something that you, um, you, you spoke in your presentation, which was about the role that the global trade um, on, the, on the deforestation, biodiversity, social impact, and so on, um, which is definitely a hot topic that will be discussed, uh, that has been discussed now in Kuming and will be discussed uh, in Glasgow uh, in a few weeks. Um, 
And so in one hand, we see some, some markets or some companies coming up with public or voluntary um, deforestation commitments. And we are also seeing some governments, especially here in the consumer markets in Europe, UK, um, also coming up with bills or new potential regulations to, to regulate what's so-called imported deforestation and try to address the problem. And we saw today uh, the Advinda's um, quote in the Guardian uh, mm-hmm. saying that this, this um, deforestation commitment, zero deforestation commitments is, are welcome, but maybe not enough uh, to address the problem. So I just wanted to ask um, you what would be, and maybe your fingers uh, take on that as well, but what do you see the role of companies and especially the consumer markets uh, in trying to address this problem? Uh, because I think, you know, just ahead of COP26, we have a great opportunity. And you mentioned about the pressure that is really important to pressure decision makers to actually see changes. So what would you like to see, you know, consumer markets or governments speaking about it? coming up now in COP26 in COP about global trade uh, and also companies. Okay, I think that the three actors, the public, the companies and the governments have specific roles to play. I think that we absolutely need to stop, sorry, not to stop. We absolutely need to tackle the supply and production change, the global supply and production change of commodities over the world. Otherwise, no matter how many national parks we declare it's not going to work. Um, so I was delighted to see the, the, the article in the Guardian, Guardian today that there seems to be a movement for actually uh, messing around with the supply chains, right? Uh, messing around in the best possible sense, you know, just regulating and saying, so look, this you cannot do that. You just cannot do it. The same way you cannot do some things because they are just bad for people's health, even if they are good business, there must be regulations saying, well, this you cannot do it. Or you have to look at your footprint, uh, not only domestically, you also have to look at the footprint of the country everywhere the country supply from, right? So the, the footprint of not only the nature where you live, the nature where you live from, right? Which is much bigger than the place you live. So to me, a system of reporting of countries and corporations that look at the whole footprint of the whole supply and production chain is very, very important. Now, companies are not going to like it. Let's, let's face it. Uh, maybe one or two like it, but most of them, they are not going to like it. So there's where, where the countries have to regulate. You know? Countries have regulated a lot of things that private, uh, private actors would like to do, but they are just not allowed to do. So it has to happen in that way. In the corporate sector, I, I, I agree that there's no global solution without do, them doing something. I don't know whether you saw this paper by, I think it was Carl Falke last year, or um, looking at the amount of the biosphere under the control of a few corporations is absolutely massive. So something has to be done there. Uh, the corporations have to be involved in some way. I don't know how or why. One thing I can think of is again, when they feel the heat. I think public pressure could be huge in determining you know, what business you can do and what business you cannot do anymore. Uh, that's my, my, my take on it. How exactly to make it happen is probably beyond the, the expertise of a plant ecologist, but I think it needs to happen. So it's a combination between carrots and sticks and, and people who make a lot, a lot of profit, we have to do less profit. Otherwise, I, I may be wrong, otherwise I think it's not physically possible. Full stop. Uh-huh. If I, if I can answer that, Peter, uh, 
I, I think uh, well, one of the consequences of these, the, the phenomenon of telecoupling that Sandra mentioned is that there's increasing disconnection between individual consumption and choice and the environmental consequences. It's very hard to have the information flow that connects what you're consuming uh, as an individual or as a society and what the impacts are on trade tropical forest frontiers. And I think the, the real surge in data, uh, both of say, Earth observation of impacts, but also big data, economic flow data, really helps to dissolve that, 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 that disconnect. And I know the work that you, you've been doing with TRACE and the TRACE initiative is really pioneering uh, in, in helping uh, Andre with, with, with that, that sort of connection. Uh, and I think this, that, that is essential because once you have that, that direct connection, then uh, the, the leverage that society has with companies and then companies have, have, have uh, uh, with uh, uh, environmental degradation becomes much, much more important. And taking one example, the, uh, in Brazil, the, the, until the last few years, the large scale reduction in deforestation rates in the Amazon was to a significant extent driven by the moratorium on soy and beef for new deforestation. It wasn't perfect, but that uh, power that companies feeling, feeling the pressure of the consumers had in terms of influencing uh, what was happening at the, at the deforestation frontier in Brazil was strongly linked to, to the visibility of their supply chains and, and the data that was there. So I think uh, you know, with the, state, the announcement that it seems likely to happen in COP, I think it's a significant contribution to, tr to trying to improve that visibility and responsibility. Uh, if I may, Javinda, just to reinforce your point, uh, I think this traceability work is absolutely crucial. And as a spin-off of that, I think it's extremely important that the products, the things that people buy, the, the goods and service people buy have a very clear, very explicit labeling, right? Because uh, that traceability work, uh, it's, it's, it's great, we, we know it and it's wonderful, but it needs to get to people who do the shopping every day. It needs to get to people who choose a holiday. It, it needs to get to people who want to buy a new car or a, or a new apartment or, or, or give money to a company. And it has to be really, really clearly labeled. To, to give you a, a very concrete example, in my country, all the new laws for new protected areas that go through Congress, like, yes, of course, everybody votes, wonderful. All the big, all the big interests in the country just vote for all these protected areas and pay for, pay for the, you know, the publicity and the, and the signing and everything. But last week, there was a, a new law for labeling, for labeling where the products come from and what the footprint is on the front label and big enough. And that was completely stuck in Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever you want to go for, for the root causes, <laughs> then it's much more difficult than going for the cosmetic ones. Just to, I noticed Holly in the, in the uh, chat asks whether uh, there are initiatives on, on labeling food. This, this, I just want to highlight some interesting work being done by the Martin School here, together with WWF, but they're coming up with a, a very detailed uh, uh, database that, that works at farm level and caps the variance between farms of look, trying to come up with a food labeling system that would enable you to have a simple category labeling on the environmental impact of every packet of biscuits you buy, et cetera, as well. That, that, that could be quite, quite transformative. Uh, great. OK, I think we're half, well, well past our, uh, uh, 5.30. So I think it's a good time to draw this conversation to, to a close. I wanted to, it's been absolutely fascinating, Sandra. I think uh, you know, there's a lot of, we ended up there on some very practical implications and, and, and ways forward. But also, I think many parts of this discussion have touched on very fundal, fundamental philosophical and ethical questions about how we relate to the natural world that we emerge from. And I, I think a lot of your work and thinking about this has been quite pioneering and quite important in, in trying to understand how best to frame the many ways of looking at human relationships to, from, to the natural world from which we emerge. So I'd like to thank you for that, Sandra. Uh, in the tradition that we have in these seminars, many of you are new, 
we unmute at the end of the seminar so we have a good old style audible applause for our speaker uh, there as well so i encourage you to unmute your microphones and give her a round of applause <laughs> Uh, what I what I uh, thank you very much, everyone. The question has been really, really provocative, really very interesting. Although I couldn't answer all of them, of obviously, uh, the only thing I really miss from from the OCTV seminars is the drinks afterwards. <laughs> the conversations are still great, uh, great, but the drinks are missed. <laughs> well, hopefully, we'll make it up to you sometimes, Andre. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Very nice to see you all. The, the recording will be put onto YouTube, so, so feel free to share with colleagues and others there more widely. I'll put it on later today. So, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Thanks.